experience we are having together and tonight I want to invite you to the book of Second Kings. We are going to meditate on this passage, verse 1 through 27. I know that should scare some of us, but maybe we are getting used to this. I repeat to say, it's not what we say, it's what the word of the Lord says. So it's far much better for us to read more than to talk from our minds. If you are agreeable to that, can you say Amen? Amen. I'm using a slightly different translation tonight. Uh, it's known as the Message Bible. Uh, you are not forced to follow that. You can still follow yours. The story is the same or the content is the same. But I've used that for the sake of its clarity in areas that I need us to consider. And so we are reading. Joram, son of Ahab, began his rule over Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. He was king for 12 years. In God's sight, he was a bad king. But he wasn't as bad as his father and mother. To his credit, he destroyed the obscene bow stone that his father had made, but he hung on to the civic practices of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, the ones that had corrupted Israel for so long. He wasn't about to give them up. King Mesha of Moab raised sheep. He was forced to give the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and another 100,000 rams. When Ahab died, 
the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So, King Joram set out from Samaria and prepared Israel for war. His first move was to send a message to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Would you join me and fight him? I am with you all the way, said Jehoshaphat. My troops are your troops. My horses are your horses. Which route shall we take? Through the badlands of Edom. The king of Israel, the king of Judah, and the king of Moab, of Edom, started out on what proved to be a looping detour. After seven days, they had run out of water for both army and animals. The king of Israel said, Bad news? God has gotten us three kings out of here to dump us into the hands of more. But Jehoshaphat said, Isn't there a prophet of God anywhere around through whom we can consult God? One of the servants of the king of Israel said, Elisha, son of Jephat, a shepherd, is around somewhere. The one who was with Elijah's right hand man. Jehoshaphat said, Good, a man we can trust. So the three of them, the king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, and the king of Edom, went to meet him. Elisha addressed the king of Israel What do you and I have in common? Go, consult the puppet prophets of your father and mother. Never, said the king of Israel. It's God who has gotten us into this fix, dumping all three of us kings into the hand of God. Elisha said, As God of the angel armies lives, and before whom I stand, ready to say, if it weren't for the respect I have of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I wouldn't give you the time of day. But consider it, bring me a minstrel. Are you still following this story? When a minstrel played, the power of God came on Elisha. He then said, God's way, dig the church all over this valley. Here's what will happen. You will want hear the wind. You will want, you want to see the rain. But this valley is going to fill up with water and your army and your animals will drink their fill. This is easy for God to do. He will also hand over more to you. You will ravage the country, knock out its fortifications, level the key villages, clear cut the orchards, clog the springs, and then litter the cultivated field to the storms. In the morning, it was at the hour of morning sacrifice. The water had arrived. Water pouring in from the west, from Edom, a flash flood filling the valley with the water. By this time, everyone in Moab had heard that the kings had come up to make war against him. Everyone who was able to handle a sword was called into service and took a stand at the border. They were up and ready early in the morning when the sun rose over the water. From where the Moabites stood, the water reflecting the sun looked like red, like blood. Blood! Look at the blood! They say, the kings must have fought each other. A bloody massacre. Go for the loot. More. When more entered the camp of Israel, the Israelites were up on their feet, killing Moabites right and left, and Moabites running for their lives. Israelites relentless in person, the slaughter. They leveled the towns, littered the converted fields with the rocks, clogged the springs, and clear cut the orchards. Only the capital, Kiel Hastrethset, was left intact. And that, not for long. It too was surrounded and attacked with the throne and flung rocks. Shall we pray? Mighty Lord, tonight, it is our privilege to sit before you, to listen to your word, meditate upon the same. 
We recognize, Lord, without your presence, without uh, you taking us through your word, none of us is going to understand it. And so we plead with you. May you talk to us because we are listening and we are ready to take whatever you give us tonight. To your name's glory we pray. Amen. I appreciate that some of us may not have been there last night, and so it would not be very fair for us to jump with what we have been talking without reminding us also what we covered last night. Last night we were here meditating from the book of Esther, and the title of the same one was, I am a Jew. And the whole purpose of our sermon last night was reflected in the subtitle of the sermon, which was Redeeming lost identities. I know when sermons are presented, it's not always that everything that may have been planned for that particular moment may be shared or may be delivered. But one thing that we learned last night was that sometimes we may go through experiences you may not truly understand. The moments in our lives, sometimes we may feel ignored or may be abandoned. We may even be tempted to think that God has forgotten us, but we reminded ourselves last night through the character of Mordecai that God may seem to ignore us, but God will always remember us. He doesn't forget us. If you are with me and you remember what we talked last night, can you say a big amen? amen? And we noted what happens when God remembers. In other words, we have a God who remembers. We saw from various parts, we talked about how Joseph was remembered after men had forgotten him for many years or for some time. When he thought that he was done, God remembered him. One thing we underlined and emphasized last night in our presentation was the fact that it is good sometimes that men or human beings should forget us so that the Lord should remember us at the right moments. Many times we want to be remembered, but we open the note. We want to be remembered at the wrong times. If God is going to give every whim of our prayers, we may find ourselves in trouble and serious challenges in this life. So we learned last night that it is wise of us to allow God to take the lead and us leading him. If you still believe it, say amen. So we talked about a God who remembers. But tonight, when you look at our schedule, we are supposed to talk about when he saw a vis to cover him. But something happened, which I'd like to ask your permission, that we adjust our list on the schedules. If you noted well, you should have noted that we submitted more sermons than we made for this week. Amen? So if we are to catch up, it means we need to take one sermon out. And so we have decided tonight to take out the sermon that was supposed to be delivered tonight so that we should catch up and instead we will present a sermon that was supposed to be delivered tomorrow night. And the sermon title tonight is very simple. We can even read together. If you don't mind, what is it? Big. I read a story of a pastor and a brother from a church who took a visitor on a fishing expedition on a boat. Once in the middle of the lake, the pastor said, I think I've forgotten my fishing pole. Be right, be right here. I'll, I'll, I'll come, I'll find you. And the visitor was just amazed to see how the pastor stepped out of the boat and walked out of the waters to the shore. It was like, wow, this pastor must be amazing. But he didn't say anything. After the pastor returned, the brother said, oh, I need to use the restroom. And he too jumped out, stepped onto the waters, went and came back. And we could just see what the face of this speaker was speaking. It was like, this man, amazing. I've read about walking on water because only Jesus. I think, no. And as they were going, something pushed in his mind, knocked him so hard. If you don't do what they're doing, you'll prove that you're the virus of these men. You too can walk. Try it. And so, as soon as they were, the other guy was sitting, he also says, excuse me, I, I, I'll be right back. And you guess what happened. The moment he stepped out of the boat, <laughs> he went into the waters. And then, oh, what's going on? Before long, the guy had gone. 
And then the pastor looked at the brother. The brother looked at the pastor. They said, we should have told him where the rocks were. <laughs> Tonight, our sermon, the purpose of our sermon is we would like to share, to talk about, to discover where the rocks are in this life. If you're with me, say amen. amen. And we're using the story that we have just read tonight. The story that is a true story. Now, time may not allow us, may not be kind enough if we have to go into every detail. And I have confessed almost every night, I was so foolish to decide that we should take from this part and that part. We should have just chosen maybe one passage and continued it for the whole week. But the story we have read, it is introducing to us the success of Ahab. So Ahab is exiting the scene, and the son, by the name of Joram, it comes into the throne or, or to the throne in the kingdom of Israel. Are you following the story? And just like it was in the days of his father, lo and behold, the Moabites gang up, they come, they are threatening, they want to attack, and they really come. They have announced they are attacking Israel because they feel like now the father is gone. We can take advantage of the young man. And the young man is scared from the reading the story. He goes out. He is calling for friends who can come and help him. But if you follow closely, the author of the story we are reading tonight says something that summarizes the life of the man we are considering tonight, Joram. He says, Joram, son of Alham, began his rule over Israel in Samaria in the 18th day of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. He was king for 12 years. And again, if you can read with me, can you read with me the next part? In God's sight, he was a bad king. But he wasn't as bad as his father and mother. To his credit, he destroyed the obscene bow stone that his father had made. I don't know how you feel when you read that. But he hung on to the practices of Jeroboam. Not bad enough. I don't know what that means, but to me, when I read that sentence, not bad enough is not good enough. So this man, he wasn't totally evil. The only thing he did was to do some partial reforms in his life. And you have right away, in other words, not bad enough is bad enough. So, regardless of what the author would like to tell us about this man, the underline, the bottom line, the best line is that this man was a bad person. You can never be partially good. There is nothing like being partially good in this life. You are either good or you are bad. Because there is no middle line in this thing. Can you say the many of you? And so he was a bad man. In other words, tonight, we are reminding ourselves that just enough is not enough. Enough. Many times we are fooled. When we come to church, we have done just enough. We have observed the Sabbath. We have returned the tithe. We have been given the rose at church. And we think this is enough. Tonight, we like to challenge ourselves that just enough is not enough before the Lord. We need to do more than just enough. If you are believing that, can you say a big amen? amen? They reform just enough. Partial spiritual reform is not a reform at all. If we are to be a people who are revived, a people who are reformed, we need to do it 100% because there's nothing like doing part of it. Our problem many of times is not lack of conversion. Our problem many of times is partial conversion. Partial conversion is not conversion at all. That is our problem. And so this person he is introduced to us as a person who had partial reforms in his life. He was not fully converted. It was because holiness is costly. Righteousness is costly. Standing up for Jesus is not a cheap business. It, it demands a lot of things in our lives. And so when he looked at the cost of abandoning everything, that the Lord desired to be abandoned. If the Lord was going to 100% be with him, 
he thought that it was a, an impossible mountain. So he decided to be partial about whatever he was going to do. So the Bible said, but he hung on to the sinful practices of Jeroboam, son of Nebai. The ones that corrupted Israel for so long, he wasn't about to give them. It was not on his agenda at any time to say, I'll leave these ones. I pray that no one who is sitting here tonight would find themselves in that category of men and women who would decide certain things they can live out in their lives and certain things they cannot do without. Even if the Lord meant to smash them, they are willing to die for what they have. So, it has happened now, but there's something that is happening in the story. Are you still following me? And this is how God looks at this fellow. Did you notice? The Bible says, in God's sight, he was a bad king. When you looked at him, when you compared him to his father, when people looked at what this man was doing, smashing things of power and all the other things, everyone could bow down and say, here we have a spiritual leader, a giant, a man who walks after the Lord. When he walks around in the villages, in the community, everyone would say a man of reform is here. They would salute him and they would recognize him as such. But lo and behold, when the Lord looked upon him, the Bible says in God's sight, he was a bad king. Are you following me? No, you're not following me because the Holy Spirit tonight is asking a person, not only to me, but even to you tonight. When he looks at you, how does heaven qualify you? How does heaven describe you? How does he analyze you? What is the summary sentence that God puts on you? It is my fear that sometimes may look at Pastor Peter, a very spiritual pastor, when he walks, he even has exaggerated steps, and people will say, what a wonderful, wonderful spiritual president. We have never had such kind of president. Look at him, even when he's sitting, he even begins to pray before he sits. Even when he's eating, he looks to the west and to the south, and the heavens, he is so spiritual. Hallelujah. But when heaven looks at Pastor Pete, what does heaven say about Pastor Pete? I don't care what is Kabula will be talking about Pastor Pete. Even when he has preached, what does heaven say about Pastor Pete? Sometimes we are fools. Because I'm a pastor, I'm an elder, I was able to lead out in the Holy Communion. They have even elected me as the best pastor today. And we think we are there. My question is, how does heaven look upon me? It is my prayer that this comes will not close before I will cry before the Lord and say, Lord, I want you to see me as I am and correct me if there's something that you need to correct. Because I've read in Luke chapter 16, verse 15. Are you with me? Jesus himself says, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. Amen. Sometimes we go around, we publish how holy, how special, how spiritual we are. But the truth is, it is us sometimes we justify ourselves. God knows our hearts. The question is, what is it that God knows about your heart? The Message Bible translating the same text. He says, you are masters at making yourself look good in front of others. But God knows what's behind the appearance. Are you following? What society sees and cause monumental, God sees through and cause monstrous. What a wonderful young man. When we have taken him as our youth leader, the whole of the blood has seen the nose. But what does the Lord see in your pockets? What does the Lord find in your phones? In your gadgets, how would heaven describe you if an angel was to come here and begin to describe you? That is my burden tonight. Just in case this could help, the Living Bible translates Luke 16, verse 15 this way. You wear a noble, pious expression in public, but God knows your evil hearts. Your pretense brings you honor from the people but it is an abomination in the sight of God 
I don't care how many millions of men and women can vote for you and worship you and glorify you and give you names of glorification. I don't care. He says you are experts. You know best how to put on France. So we have a face. When we meet a fellow Adventist, we know what kind of face to wear. Whether we want to wear a Jeremiah face, we wear a Jeremiah face. When we meet in the marketplace and we meet the people, we know what kind of face to wear to wear when we meet deacons. And we even know what kind of faces to wear when we meet the pastors, even when pastors are busy. Two minutes ago I was slapping my wife. But when the pastor comes, I have a wear on the wardrobe of my faces. Born in the front of the wonderful Holy Elder. I thought I was going to say she yeah. God says it is you who fool yourself, but you will never fool me. And so this man is described, I don't care how much revivals you have brought in your kingdom, but one thing I know, you are a bad king. That's why Paul writing in Galatians 6 verse 7 says, do not be deceived, God can never be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. If you believe him, say amen. J.B. Phillips translates the same text. He says, don't be under any illusion. You cannot make fool a fool of God. That's what it is. If you're following me tonight, we're asking this question. How do you measure up? Wherever you're sitting even right now, how do you measure up before him? And so this man was measured. He was found wanting. For the sake of our time, the guys have come. The Moabites are approaching, and he says, My friend Jehoshaphat, please can you come and help me fight these enemies who are coming? And he wakes up one morning hearing and reading the profile of Jehoshaphat, who was a mighty warrior, a man who was working with God, and he had success upon success. The other night I told you how he defeated hundreds of thousands of the Moabites, the Mennonites, and the Moabites, and the other people who came against the Ammonites. You remember that story? And uh, this guy, Joram, begins to say, if I am with Jehoshaphat, who else is going to stand against us? Are you following the story? And so they step out. He doesn't even care to go and say a prayer. Why do you say a prayer when you know what needs to be done? When you know you have men who can fight for you? So he stands up. They are going out, meeting more. They don't care whether they say God or no God. They know they have power. They have money. They have weaponry. They have mighty soldiers. They will march and fight. Little did they know that it's not about what you have. I don't care how much you have amassed in this life. It's not about your intellectual arguments. I don't care how genius you are. Your IQ has nothing to do with what the Lord can do. When he decides to do what he wants to do, can he say, begin manager with me? And so they ignore God. Are you following me? But tonight, we would like to remind ourselves, you can only ignore God at your own peril. Don't be fooled. The fact that you have not been overpowered by circumstances right now, things are in the right shape for you. Everything is prosperous about you. Don't be deluded. God will never be mocked. There comes a time you will realize who God is. Because you will never ignore him at any point. See? This sermon needed to be preached before one whole year. Amen. Are you still following me? And so they are going out. But the story says, after going for seven days, you know, that's a problem with pastors now. Because I was supposed to preach about the seven days. Have you seen what happens at the end of seven days? You have never realized. When seven days, I don't know why you choose the seven days. But I know when Noah was put into the ark, it took seven days on the seventh day, God closed the doors. And I'll tell you, there was a day this other Pharaoh is there. No, but somewhere he's coming, nobody's just dead. That's the day one, day two. It was on the seventh day when he was tempted to say, he is too late, let's just go ahead. The seventh day, that was the day that broke the king that was too proud for nothing by the name of Saul. 
Are you following me? Why does John make me? I told you the other night when Elijah's mount on Mount Carmel, they have done whatever the dead they did. He has rebelled the altar. He said, By the mighty power of heaven, now God, show these people who you are. When he had prayed, he told them, the, 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 the servant said, Go, see what is happening on the east. You remember what happened? You went there, there was nothing. You went there, there was nothing. He went there, there was nothing. The fourth time, there was nothing. The fifth time, there was nothing. The sixth time, there was nothing. He went there, the seventh time. And the whole story changed. Amen? Amen. I don't know for some reason. Maybe it's one of those rare coincidences. It's up to you. You can go and pay. But I am surprised. After seven days, our narrative says the waters, the men and women were carrying as they were going out to the battle. Seven days, they had run out of water. They had run out of water both for themselves and their animals. It was like now God is beginning to speak sense to them. You may be so proud. For some time you will prosper. Everything will not seem to work against you. But believe you me, it will not take too long before the Lord catches up with you. Can we say it again? Amen. And so they are there for the second part time. Now this is my imagination, right? The news and the donkeys cannot even whatever because they are tired. They look, they're looking for waters. Now, where you have very little water, would you mind giving them animals before you drink yourself? It means they drank all that they could. The animals were languishing. And the waters they had, the last drops they had, were getting finished. And the same proud young man comes to his senses and he says, something is happening here. We are dying. And according to what he has said, it is his confession where he says, this is not an ordinary feat. There must be a divine hand against me. God is fighting me. So he begins to point fingers at God and say he has brought us here to destroy us. This God is a cruel God. That's why I don't want to commit myself 100% to this God. He is a bad God. I told you, embarrassing us before the world. Are you following the story? I used to find the story. So they said, bad news. He has gotten us all three kings. We are done today. And it was at that moment when Jehoshaphat said, please, just a minute. Isn't there a man of God? Isn't there a prophet in Israel? Isn't there a prophet? I don't care where they are. Is there any prophet anywhere? So that we may go to and speak to that person and find out if we have made a mistake, if God can forgive us and help us fight for us. Are you following me? It's like you're foolish. But anyway, because you want to do it. And before long, the young man was behind. He said, he is there. Because he knew that the king was hesitating to respond. He knew Elisha was there. But Elisha was a nobody before this king, proud for nothing. So they say, okay, he said, okay, he said, yeah. They say, let's go to him. Are you following me? I like what this guy says. Isn't there a prophet in this life? It is like he's saying, when you are stranded, when things have come a fix, don't be too genius for nothing. Humble yourself, learn to go to the Lord. Ask for wisdom when things are not working in your life. Ask yourself, introspect. I do these things every day. But why today? There's very some things are not adding up. Because God may be speaking through circumstances. And I've seen it many times. God speaking through circumstances, bringing us back to sense, bringing us into line so that He is able to take us through the course He wants us to go. If you believe me, say amen. amen. That's why the author of the book of the Epistle of James. Chapter 1, verse 5 through 8, if you don't mind, according to the New English translation, it says, If anyone is deficient in wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously, and with that will be primed, and it will be given to him, but he must ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts 
It's like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed around by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, since he is a double-minded individual, unstable in all his ways. May the Lord forgive me for rushing through these sermons. How I wish that the Lord was to speak to us, remind us to say you will never experience his power if you are a double-minded person, a person who thinks he is a mighty philosopher. He rationalizes everything and you can doubt even as you pray. Says, but you go back to the Lord. So they did that for the sake of a time. They are consulting the Lord. One of the servants says, Elisha, son of shepherd, is around somewhere. The one who was Elijah's right in hand man. Listen to what Jehoshaphat says. And Jehoshaphat says, at that moment, go. A man we can trust. Amen. A man we can trust. You talk about Elisha. He is a man we can trust. Let's go to him. We are in time. He will pray for us. He will speak to the Lord for us. He will speak up. He will do everything for us. Because he is a man we can trust. If I had been the whole week meditating on this story together with ourselves, I was going to ask ourselves, where are the pastors today that can be trusted? Men of God, whose members can say, we will go to the pastor because we can trust him. We will tell him all our private issues. We will know he will maintain our dignity. Where are church elders today who can be there and the young men can say, he is a man we can trust. We will go to him when we are Trouble with addiction of any kind, we will go to him and say, My father, my elder, don't look at the talent I have. I sing so nicely at the church, but you know what I'm going through? Stuff is eating me. See what is in my phone. Pornography is eating me. Addiction to alcohol is eating me. All the things that you've heard about me, they're all that me. Can you say, Pigeon, for me? Yeah. Where are the Josephs in this generation? Young men. Who can speak like Joseph? Men who can be trusted by court forces. Who can say we know him. Even the entire prison force must fall under him. Because we know he is a trusted person. Where are husbands who can be trusted by their wives? They will say, I am going to London for two months. Here is my young sister. She will be cooking for you. Where are men who can be trusted by their wives? Where are women who can be trusted by their husbands? The husband goes and says, This young man will be guiding for you here. Where are the men? What we find in the stories that we read every day is a horrible embarrassment. When a woman walks the other side, the man decides to leave the workplace. Going home because there's a maid servant in the home. Don't ask me what they do. We have heard stories and you know those stories. For the sake of our time, let's pose it as a question. Where are physicians, doctors, where are lawyers, where are teachers who are trustworthy? We can go to them and rely that they are men of integrity. And so he says, for Elijah, I can trust him. It is my prayer that the Lord will help me by his grace to be a man who can be trusted, a woman who can be trusted, a father, a mother who can be trusted, an elder, a pastor who can be trusted because it is possible. When you stand with Jesus, he will give you the grace and the power to live in integrity. Can you say the amen? And so, I think that's a question we have posed here. How can you be trusted? And so, for the sake of our time, are you still following me? They are walking up now to Elijah. Now, Pastor, do you mind, Pastor, coming here? You're going to be the Elisha. Amen. I love my pastor, he's a good guy. Now, who would like to volunteer to be Jehovah here? Any volunteer, Jehovah? One minute. Do not stand too long. Even the doctors can volunteer. I will volunteer for you. Oh, there's one who has come. Please. I like you. Very powerful. Let's 
say a big amen for him. Amen. So you're going to be Jehoshaphat. Who would like to be uh, the most admirable Jehoshaphat? Who would like to be the Jehoshaphat? No, he didn't even become the Jehoshaphat. Oh, oh, the doctor has come. Oh, come, 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 the doctor. Come, come, come. I want the palace of God. Are you with me? And so, the man Elijah, stand there, Elijah. He says, men are coming. Are you with me? Look at the face. They are coming with the whole effect. When you are visiting a man of God, you don't walk like anything. You begin to shut up. You know how you even dress yourself so well. They are walking long faces, going to the man of God. Are you in career advance? They are coming so spiritual. And they are coming. And lo and behold, as they open their mouth, the man who opens his mouth is Jehoram. And believe me, hear the voice of the Lord coming from the man of God, Elisha. He says, who are you that you can come to me? You can dare consult my face. You can dare speak to me. You can dare pray to me. You can dare offer your offerings to me. Who are you? I have no time for you. Are you following me? My prayers and Lord, please, let me not reach that point. I don't know what heaven thinks about my prayers when I pray. Does he consider it the same way? But for grace, something happens. Are you following? He says, he looks at the other, he says, who is the one who's with you? Who is that one? He says, this is Jehoshua. He says, you are lucky today. Are you with me? You are lucky today. Can you say, you are lucky today? Can you try? If it was not for Jehoshua, I was not going to give you my best. You would not have my presence. I will not grant you an audience if it was not for the worshiper. Oh Lord, forgive me for being a fool to decide to preach so many things in a short week like this one. I was going to remind ourselves tonight how Jesus stands in between us and the Father. When our prayers cannot reach the throne because of who we are. Jesus, God is asking, who are you jumping to preach before my people? If you were not for Christ, I was not going to take it. Amen. When you are kneeling down, holy, 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 the prayers of Adventism. <laughs> Immediately, angels in heaven are ready with lightnings to shout, to pulverize us. Jesus steps in. When the Father looks at the Son, He says, if you were not for Jesus, I was going to destroy you, Mama. Because I know you have contraceptives even when you are not married in your pocket. I know what you are doing last night in your office. If it was not for the blood of my son. Thank Jesus that he died for you. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. And so, the guy has been told. He says, anyway, speak whatever you want to speak. And so, Elijah begins to speak. Can they go now? This is a safe beginning for them. Amen. You have been saved because of them. Yes, the Hoshaphat. You should be working with the Hoshaphat. Hallelujah. You know what? If I had done, I know my time was already, so I have to cut my sermon. Are you following me? Yes. If I had time, I was going to ask ourselves, blessed are men and women who stay with Jehoshaphat in their homes. Blessed is a family where lives a Jehoshaphat. When God wants to destroy this family, a Jehoshaphat holds God's anger against it. He says, if you don't for your wife, <laughs> no. I was going to crush you today. Do you know some of us are living today, we owe it to our wives. When you are slapping her, and I'm not promoting slapping her, you should remember that I'm slapping my own Savior here. Yeah. If it was not for the prayer of my wife, some of us were as good as dead, long time. We should have been fired from our work places. It was just because my wife prays, and God listens to the prayer. And God says, for the sake of this woman, for the sake of this orphan, for the sake of that grandmother, for the sake of the neighbor who relies on you, sometimes I've been saved. You don't understand? I don't have time. So he says, if you are not for this man, but consider it. So he considers and he says, gives me a minister for the sake of a time which is running faster than I could speak. 
This one, let's forget about it. You can go and read for yourself. Psalm 15, verse 15. Where God says, I'll take verse 16. For the sake of our time, he says, But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate to spring and you cast my words behind you. You don't have the right to speak before them. You don't have the right to kneel down before him and pray when your lips are far away from God's will. How dare you do it? Where do you get the audacity of coming to church announcing here? Oh, tomorrow there's going to be company day. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When just last night, you were in wrong places. You positioned in the wrong places. God says, how dare you do that? If you are not for Christ, you should have seen how I have embarrassed you. Can you say big amen? So, one day I will pray that the Lord will stop this time. <laughs> but for tonight, it's okay. So, the minstrel has been played. Are you following the story? As the minstrel is played, and the Holy Spirit comes on Elisha, God is speaking, he is ready for the sake of Jehoshaphat, for the sake of men who are able to bring sense in the minds of others. He says, says the God of armies, this is what he says. God's word, deep ditches all over this valley. Here is what will happen. You want to hear the wind, you want to see the rain. But this valley is going to fill up with water and your army and your animals will drink their fill. This is easy for God. I love that. This is easy for the Lord. When you have done the right thing, this is easy for the Lord. Tomorrow, go back for the sake of Jehoshaphat. I want you to go to the dry land, the valley, even when the enemies are watching you. But I want you to do a very simple thing for me. Just dig ditches for yourself. How foolish is that? Your friends are coming in with a theory about this AK-47, all these, whatever you talk about them, and you're going there, you're taking your shoulders, <laughs> digging ditches. That's foolishness, right? But remember how we have said, the foolishness of the Lord is the best wisdom we're going to ever have. Because even the best mighty men strategies of this world, they are so foolish when it comes comparing to them what the Lord can give us as a sense. Can we say it again? Amen. So for the sake of our time, they go, they do that, and lo and behold, they dig all over the ditches. After they dig the ditches, the testimony comes in the text. And I want to, you to notice this. It's not fair for us to have a best friend that says it was at the hour of morning time. Lord, I don't know why you chose that time. I know God could have chosen any time. But it was the hour of prayer. It was the time of sacrifice. When the Lord decided to do what he can even do. And so it was at the moment, as they are sacrificing, Lord, in the morning, Lord, oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. But they have done their ditches. You don't sing that song when you have not dug your ditch. It is a serious mistake. That is why we are having worship in our homes, but we are never transformed. We are never changed. We are the very same people we are even before you baptized. Because you pray for the ditch, the ditches are dug. So that that they are singing. And the Bible says, waters from nowhere. And I love this. Waters from nowhere. They began to come. And they came. I know what Jesus has said in John 3, verse 5 to 8. He says, I tell you the solemn truth. Unless a person is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born of the flesh is flesh. And what is born of the spirit is flesh. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind, you can even read with me, what does he say? The wind blows where it will, and you hear the sound it makes, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. When you have done your ditches, you don't know what changes your life. You don't know what transforms you. You don't know what time the Holy Spirit fills in the soul. Because he comes 
but he must find ditches in our lives. Do you have ditches enough? Deep enough for the Holy Spirit to fill them with the waters of life. Time may not be on my side. Oh, soon enough, the Moabites are coming. They are coming. Charge for the war. We will win the battle. So, so, general, so, so, whatever they did, they're watching. I, I came here by to remind you again when you have dug your ditches, you are standing in the right position. You have rebuilt your altars. You are saying, I am a Jew. I will do what my Jewishness calls for. I will stand for Christ. I am here to remind you, we have a God who will confuse your enemy. He will send delusions in your enemies. All they will see is confusion. Amen. Why do you waste your time fighting people? Fight with the Lord. Your greatest enemy, if anything, is the thing that hides God from you. Fight it. And so this morning they came out. As they are coming, the Moabites, the Lord, I love you. He simply sent the sun to shine. It was breaking. Just like it does every day. But my story says there was the, the sunshine reflected the reflection of his own. By the mighty power of heaven that respects and honors men and women, young boys who have dug their ditches, they are standing in the right positions. He made the Moabites to look at the water as if it was blood. It was red. I'm going to just imagine this is Pastor Peter's imagination. Are you with me? Dr. Jacob, I've seen you. God bless you, you're here. So they're yeah, here. Yeah. Oh, oh, blood. Oh, blood, blood, blood. Oh, blood. You're going to enjoy me. You don't want to enjoy me? Blood. Oh, blood. Oh, oh, blood. And the other soldier on the other side, confused. This is what is happening? Then they begin to give themselves furious. They say, oh, these men now. You see, they are quarreling among themselves. At the end of the day, our gods have fought for us. <laughs> their gods have fought for them. I don't know. So they are excited. And they are coming for the sake of our time. They say they went around. They have relaxed and even thrown their weapons aside. And lo and behold, the Israelite soldiers were just around. They came and killed every single one of them. And I highlighted the entire army, paralyzed everything, including whatever was promised in the prophecy. Because God was fighting for them. Can you see the, can you say the Stand up for Jesus, that's the best thing we can say tonight. Dig your teachers. Stand up for Jesus. Dig your teachers, confuse your enemy. When the teachers are dead so deep enough, the whole of heaven is going to fill them with the presence of his mighty power, his presence, the Holy Spirit, who will make you smile even in the midst of storms, even when everyone is cascading you, they are speaking negative against you. Everything around you feels like it's falling apart. The Holy Spirit filling your life will give you a shining face that will confuse your enemies. They don't even understand that you're going through cancer. You can afford to smile because this God and it confuses the enemy. Confuse your enemy. Dig your ditches deep. If the ditch is shallow, God will not fill it with water enough. The deeper, the deeper it is, the more water levels is going to comply there. How deep is the well? Some of us, our speech is so low, so shallow, it only comes when it is Friday. When we go out by the end of the sunshine on the Sabbath, it all evaporates and we are the nobodies in the streets. Can you say shame? Deep, deep, so that when the Holy Spirit fills, you are 24, 7, 365 days filled with the Holy Spirit. Deep, deep waters of the Holy Spirit in your life. So that wherever you go, men just begin to confess. Why are you coming to us? Do you want to destroy us with your holiness? Even before the judgment has come, they will call you a divorce of them, who will prick their conscience when they see you. Mm. Are you with me? The deep of the ditch. Can we read it together this one? The deeper the, the, deep the ditch, the deeper the water lies. 
What again? The shallow of the ditch, the shallow of the water they cross. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. God cannot overflow his presence in you when you are not doing your part to dig the words, to allow him to scorch your lips, to make you the person you are supposed to be when you stand in the wrong places, when you deny your true identity. There's no way God is going to feel that. So those blood, blood, blood. This one now is Malachi 4 verse 2. He says, but you who respect my name, the son of vindication will rise with healings and will skip you about like calves released from the storm. Time may not, allow me, may not allow me to expound on that. But for you who honor my me, goodness will shine on you like the sun with healing in its hand. The very same sun. It was a curse to the enemies. It was a confusion to the enemies. But God said, the son of righteousness, Jesus, as he's scaring your enemies, he will bring healing to you. He will bring prosperity in your life. He will help you stand the storms until you make it into the purpose of heaven. That's what he has promised. How I wish that this sun rises on my life. Dig your beaches. Let's close for the sake of our time. But I know Jesus says, anyone who says to me, come. Anyone who believes in me, may come and drink. John 7, verse 37 to 39. He says, I'm the living water. John 15, verse 5 says, without me, you cannot do anything. Don't delude yourself. Don't walk, don't go out to battle without the presence of them. Be a Jehoshaphat. Who will not dare step into the battlefront before he speaks to the king? Because your success is in the name of God. The problem that we have, most of us have clogged the wells. That is a serious problem. Jeremiah defines the problem in this way. He summarizes by saying, my people have done two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have bare for themselves broken fishes that can hold water. No wonder we are embarrassed. Wherever we turn, it's a store of embarrassment. The more I seem to be the path people in the way. When it was you, God said, you will never be tears. You are supposed to be heard, but we can never be heard until we dig our teachers. And the Holy Spirit feels that. I may not allow me. This one, let's close it there. Shouldn't take you. Otherwise, I'll take you for granted and preach and preach and preach until you say tomorrow I shouldn't come again. I want to come back tomorrow. Amen. So I'll cut the long story. Amen? Amen. See, I'm a good pastor. I can cut it so much. <laughs> but I was going to tell you, you can read for yourself in Genesis chapter 6. I want us to borrow the Isaac wisdom. Where when he was going about, he went to the land of the people and they said, everyone hated him. He went to the wells of his fathers. When he dug a well, the enemies around could come and throw stones, throw everything, and fill it with mud and everything. And this man was always in trouble. But there's one thing that the Isaac did, the Isaac wisdom I would like to submit to you. He went back to the wells and removed all the clothes and the waters would come back. You and I, most of us, need to stay there. We need to go back and dig the wells again. Some of us are had the ditches, but they have been filled by filthy thinking. They have been filled by the worldly things that we love and all the cares of this life, so much so that our spiritual wells are a plug too full for the Holy Spirit to make sense in our life. Go back and dig the wells. It's the faith of our fathers. Are you there tonight? And you're saying, Lord, I'm so stupid. I didn't know. My well has been clogged up by pornography. My wells have been clogged up by envy, hatred, jealousy, name it. But I want this, sweet Lord, give me the grace to open, to dig. I am willing to dig my ditches. I don't care how long it will take me. But I want to dig this ditch one more time. And I want to invite you into my life. Will you go refill this clock the way when I have done it? And I have good news for you. This God I'm preaching is more than willing to refill the clock the way if you dig them enough. And I want to dig my deep enough so that when I walk, even men who seize me, they should run away. I should 
be a Jehoshaphat in my society that will preach the conscience. When they see me, they will say, he talks to his God. They will always say, they are cowards. Are you there? God bless you. Let him speak whatever I can speak beyond this. I am not able to do that. Shall we pray? Father, we are so foolish. Many times we are blinded by the tradition, the customs, the philosophies, the psychologists in this world. Even our theologists are confused many times. And we think we know better than you do. We are full of ourselves. We don't even say a prayer walking out of our bed. The last time some of us prayed is 10 years ago when we were being baptized. We've never come to your altars. We beat our wives, we beat our husbands, we abuse our children. Yet we still pretend. Tonight we say, You are foolish. Your seven days are coming to a close. You will be embarrassed before you embarrass us before the universe, Lord. We pray through the name of Jesus, our Jehoshaphat, that you will grant us an opportunity. Can you speak to us? Tell us in this sermon, go back, dig your wells. And we are willing not to do that because we want you to take our battles on the shoulders and fight for us. Let the Moabites know we have a God who even when we have offended can still come back to us and fill our wells. So fill us now. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.